222 day where we will talk about XLM and how it is incredibly involved in the global financial system redesign, which is revolving around the DLT. And a lot of what I have talked about involves Project M Bridge and the monetary authority of Singapore. But I have also talked a lot about Ukraine and how the transparent network and the Prozora network are built on Stellar and are in operation right now. Stellar has a ton of eyes into the major players and elites, such as BlackRock. And there have been some coincidental hints of how Stellar could become increasingly important in 2025. Today, we will break down the Stellar for CBDC's white paper in a way that is a lot easier to digest and understand as compared to just trying to pick apart the actual white paper itself. Okay, so get this right. What if sending money internationally was like uh, as easy as sending a text, like mm -hmm. instant payments to anyone, anywhere, yeah. and a financial system that actually works for everyone? Right. Well, that's the potential of central bank digital currencies, yep. CISADCs especially when they're built on blockchain. And that okay. is what we are going to explore today using a white paper um, called Stellar for CBDCs. Okay. So think of a white paper, like a, um, a deep dive into a complex topic, kind of like what we do here, just in written form. Yeah, it's a great analogy. So this white paper lays out how Stellar, which is a specific type of blockchain, could be the foundation for... Uh, for this new financial reality, really. And we're gonna unpack how it works, why it's good for CBDCs and what it all means uh, for you. And this is not just some, you know, like far off futuristic concept. This is actually something that a lot of central banks are looking into right now. Yeah, it's definitely a hot topic. Um, and the pandemic really accelerated this whole trend, you know, as governments and financial institutions were looking for ways to distribute aid more efficiently. And CBDCs, offer a potential solution for this. Yeah, it's amazing how a global event like that can just, you know, push innovation forward. Right. So let's talk about Stellar. What is it and why is it relevant to this whole CBDC conversation? So Stellar is an open source network that connects financial systems. And it was specifically designed for issuing and managing assets, things like CBDCs. You know, historically, one of the big challenges with digital money has been this trade-off between control and interoperability. Uh-huh. You know, like you could have closed systems like a private network, but they were very limited in their ability to interact with other systems. OK, so like a walled garden, secure but isolated. Exactly, exactly. Yeah. On the other hand, you had joint systems where many different entities could participate, but they were more vulnerable because if one player was compromised, the whole system was basically affected. Right, right, right. So blockchain technology and Stellar in particular offers a solution because it provides both interoperability and security. So how does Stellar achieve that? Does it use like the energy intensive mining that we hear about with Bitcoin? That's a great question. And that's a key difference. Stellar doesn't rely on mining for security. Instead, it uses trusted entities like central banks to validate transactions. OK. And this approach not only sidesteps the energy concerns associated with mining, but it also aligns perfectly with the way central banks already operate. OK, that's smart, especially with the increasing focus on sustainability these days. So Stellar brings trust, security and energy efficiency to the table. What else makes it um, a good fit for CBDCs? Well, the white paper dives into four key features. The first is secure asset issuance. So Stellar allows the issuer, let's say a central bank, to control who can hold and transact with a CBDC. And they do this using what are called authorization flags. Uh -huh. So think of it like setting permissions on a shared document, right? You can control who can view, edit, or even access the document. You have that control over your CBDC. Got it. Got it. Okay. So that's like a layer of control built right in. Exactly. What's the second feature? Okay. So the second is enhanced compliance capability. Stellar ensures that transactions can't be reversed. Okay. Which is critical for any financial system. And they do this through the Stellar Consensus Protocol, okay. SCP. Without getting too technical, SCP works more like a secure voting system among known trusted validators rather than the energy-intensive methods that some blockchains use. 
So this means your transactions are final and tamper-proof. So it's like a network of trusted parties verifying every transaction, basically. Exactly. Yeah. Okay, that makes sense for something as important as a national currency. What about the third feature? Okay, this is where it gets really interesting, I think. The third feature is automatic interoperability. So Stellar allows different currencies on its network to interact seamlessly. Imagine, right, you can send money to someone in another country using your CBDC, mm -hmm. and it's automatically converted to their CBDC on the other end. Yeah. Like instantly and without any fees. That would be revolutionary. Right. International payments are such a pain point right now. So anything that simplifies that would be huge. Definitely. Okay. So we've got security, compliance, interoperability. What's the fourth key feature? Okay. So the fourth one is Stellar's ability to integrate with existing financial systems. Okay. And even other blockchains. It's not about like ripping and replacing everything. It's more about building bridges and expanding the possibilities. No, that's smart. That makes adoption uh, much smoother and less disruptive. So we've got a good sense of stellar strength, but how would this actually play out in the real world? How would a CBDC built on stellar actually work? Well, the white paper has a hypothetical example of a two-tier system. Mm. So imagine the central bank issuing the CBDC to commercial banks, much like they do with physical cash today. And then those commercial banks distribute the digital currency to consumers. Okay, so it mirrors the existing system in some ways. Right. But where does the innovation come in? Well, the innovation is in the efficiency, security, and accessibility. Mm -hmm. So think about all the paperwork and time involved in opening a bank account today. Yeah. Especially for someone who doesn't have a traditional financial history. Stellar's features could streamline those know your customer and customer due diligence checks, those KYCCDD processes you always hear about. Yeah but still ensuring compliance. So it could potentially make financial services more accessible to people who are currently excluded from the system. Absolutely, yeah. <laughs> and the white paper even suggests using non-traditional verifiers, like post offices, oh, wow. to help people get access. Imagine walking into your local post office and being able to open a digital wallet for CBDC. Like, it could be a game changer for financial inclusion. That's a great example of how this technology can really make a difference in people's lives. Right. Okay, so we have the central bank issuing commercial banks distributing and individuals accessing CBDC through various methods, including digital wallets. Where does the central bank fit in beyond issuing the CBDC? Well, the central bank also plays a crucial role as a validator on the Stellar network, okay, ensuring the integrity of the CBDC ledger. They can choose which organizations they trust to participate in this consensus process which adds another layer of security. So it's a collaborative system with built-in trust? Yes. That makes sense, given the importance of a national currency. This is fascinating stuff. Yeah. Um, but I'm curious about one thing. We hear a lot about smart contracts in the blockchain world, but the white paper doesn't seem to emphasize them as much. Yeah, that's a sharp observation, and there's a good reason for that. While some blockchains rely heavily on smart contracts for programmability, Stellar takes a slightly different approach. Okay, I'm all ears. How does Stellar handle programmability? Okay, so instead of relying on traditional smart contracts, which can be complex and introduce security risks, Stellar has built-in features that offer a good deal of control and automation for CBDCs. For instance, imagine a government wants to make sure that social benefit payments are only used for essential goods, like food or rent. Yeah. So they could issue a separate asset specifically for those payments and require accounts to go through an approval process before they can hold it. This ensures that the funds are used for their intended purpose. Okay. It's not a traditional smart contract, but it achieves the same goal in a more controlled and secure environment. It's like having a built-in safety net for those benefits, you know? Exactly. Yeah. Ensuring they reach those in need and are used appropriately. That's impressive. It seems like Stellar was designed to be adaptable to different needs and situations. Exactly. And that adaptability, combined with its focus on security and interoperability, is why it's attracting so much attention in the world of CBDCs. It's all starting to click now. We've seen how Stellar's unique approach could address many of the challenges associated with traditional financial systems. But what about the implications for individuals like you and me? We'll explore that further in the next part of our deep dive. Stay tuned. Welcome back. You know, it's fascinating to see how Stellar addresses these fundamental challenges of control and interoperability in a digital financial system. Right. It's unlike those uh, anonymous blockchain networks. Stellar relies on known and trusted entities like central banks mm -hmm. 
to ensure that system's security and integrity. That's a key difference. With Stellar, you have like that transparency and accountability built right in. You know exactly who is responsible for validating those transactions. Exactly. One of the things that really stood out to me in this white paper was, um, was the emphasis on financial inclusion. You know, like the idea that CBDCs on Stellar could actually reach people who are currently excluded from traditional banking. It's an important aspect for sure. And it aligns with Stellar's mission to create equitable access to the global financial system. They gave some really practical examples of how this could actually work. Remember we talked about using post offices as verifiers yeah, yeah. for people who don't have traditional bank accounts. That's one way to bridge that gap. It's a really innovative idea. Using existing infrastructure to solve a real world problem. I was also intrigued by the potential for um, self-hosted wallets. Yeah. The white paper described them as being similar to holding cash, but in digital form. Yeah, it's a good analogy. Yeah. Users would have complete control over their private keys, uh -huh. which gives them a level of autonomy and privacy that you don't always get with traditional banking. Yeah. You're not relying on a third party to manage your funds. Right. That's empowering. But I imagine there are also some risks involved. Absolutely. With self-hosted wallets, there's greater responsibility. If you lose your private keys, you've lost access to your funds. There's no way to recover them. So it's like losing your physical wallet, but with potentially much higher stakes? Exactly. It seems like education and awareness would be key here. Oh, for sure. Users yeah. would need to really understand the importance of securely storing their private keys. Now, we've talked a lot about the potential benefits of Stellar for CBDCs, but what about the, uh, the potential downsides or risks? Are there any challenges that central banks really need to consider? That's a really important question. Yeah. No technology is perfect, right? Mm. There are always trade-offs. Um, so I would say scarability is one. Okay. Can the Stellar network handle the massive volume of transactions that a widely adopted CBDC would require? Yeah. We're talking about potentially millions, even billions of transactions per day. Yeah. Stellar is designed for efficiency but it's crucial to make sure it can scale to meet that kind of demand. Yeah, we wouldn't want to see any bottlenecks or delays, especially with something as important as a national currency. What other challenges come to mind? Well, the regulatory landscape is a big one. Okay. The CBDCs are relatively new. Yeah. The rules and regulations are still evolving. Uh huh. Central banks would need to work closely with regulators to establish clear guidelines. Right. It's all about finding that balance between innovation and responsible governance. Exactly, yeah. So much to think about. Right. Speaking of governance, how would a CBDC potentially impact a central bank's ability to, um, to manage the economy? That's a great question. CBDCs could change the way central banks manage the money supply and interest rates. Mm -hmm. They could also impact the stability of the whole financial system. It's definitely something that requires a lot of analysis and planning to ensure a smooth transition. So central banks would need to model and simulate different scenarios right. to really understand the potential consequences. Yes. This brings up another point that's often discussed, the concept of programmability. Right. We touched on this a little earlier, but mm. I'd like to dig a little deeper. This idea of programming money to behave in specific ways is fascinating. It is. But it also raises some questions. Sure. So you could have like conditional payments that are only executed when certain conditions are met. Exactly. Streamlining government programs. Yes. Automating payments in supply chains. But wouldn't that level of control raise some concerns about privacy? It's a valid concern, for sure. It's important to strike a balance. Yeah. Between the potential benefits of programmability and the need to protect individual privacy. We don't want a system where the government is tracking every single transaction. Right. I, that would be a bit Orwellian. Right. It's about finding that right balance, as with so many things in the world of CBDCs. Yeah, I think so. Now, one final thought before we wrap up this part of our deep dive. The white paper emphasized the importance of collaboration yes. between central banks and the private sector uh -huh. when it comes to CBDCs. Why is that? Well, the successful implementation of CBDCs is going to require a joint effort. Okay. Central banks bring their expertise in monetary policy and financial regulation, while the private sector brings the innovation and technological capabilities. It sounds like a true partnership, with both sides working together to shape the future of finance. We've covered a lot of ground in this segment. We looked at the potential challenges, the regulatory landscape, and the exciting possibilities that CBDCs offer. 
But what's next for this evolving landscape? We'll explore that and more in the final part of our deep dive. Welcome back to our deep dive into the world of CBDCs and Stellar. Yeah. We've explored the technical features of Stellar, talked about the potential benefits and challenges of CBDCs, and even touched on some of those um, ethical considerations. It's been quite a journey. Yeah, it has. We've seen how Stellar's unique approach, relying on trusted validators and focusing on interoperability, positions it as like a strong contender in the race yeah. to build the infrastructure for CBDCs. Absolutely. And we've also talked about, you know, striking that balance between innovation and responsibility. Yeah. Making sure that CBDCs are designed to truly serve the needs of everyone, while also protecting privacy and maintaining financial stability. But what's next? What are the key trends and developments to watch as this whole CBDC landscape continues to evolve? Well, it's clear that many central banks are moving beyond like the exploration phase yeah. and into experimentation. Okay. We're starting to see pilot programs and real world trials being launched in several countries. So it's moving from theory into practice. Exactly. That makes sense. What kind of things are they testing in these pilots? Well, they're testing different aspects from the technical infrastructure to the user experience. They're looking at things like how to distribute CBDCs effectively, how to ensure security and prevent fraud, and how to integrate CBDCs into existing payment systems. It's like a real-world test drive for these new digital currencies, yeah, what happens after the pilot phase. That's when things get really interesting. Based on the results of these pilots, central banks are going to refine their designs and implementations, so we'll likely see a wave of CBDC launches in the coming years, each one tailored to the specific needs and priorities of each country. It's exciting to think about the potential impact on the global financial system. Earlier, we talked about interoperability, the ability of different CBDCs to interact seamlessly. Right. Why is that so important? Well, imagine a world where you can send money to someone in another country using your CBDC. Yeah. And it's instantly converted to their CBDC on the other end. No more waiting for days for international transfers or dealing with those hefty fees. That would be incredible. It would truly transform the way we think about global payments. Exactly. And that's where Stellar's built-in interoperability features could really shine. Hmm. It's designed to connect different financial systems, making it a natural fit for a world with multiple CBDCs. So Stellar could potentially play a key role in making this vision of a seamless global payment system a reality. It could. Now, one of the big debates in the world of CBDCs is this whole um, level of centralization versus decentralization. Yeah. Should CBDCs be issued on a permission ledger where access and control are like really tightly managed hmm. or on an open system like Stellar where participation is more open? What are your thoughts on this? That's a complex question, and there are valid arguments on both sides. A permissioned ledger offers greater control and security, which might be appealing to some central banks. Especially those concerned about maintaining stability and preventing fraud. Precisely. But an open system like Stellar fosters innovation yeah. and has the potential to reach a wider audience. Ultimately, the choice is going to depend on the specific goals and priorities of each central bank. It's a balancing act weighing the benefits and risks of each approach. As we wrap up our deep dive, I want to leave our listeners with a few final thoughts. Okay. First, remember that the future of finance is being shaped right now. CBDCs are no longer a futuristic concept. They're becoming a reality. It's an exciting time to be following these developments. Second, remember that technology is a powerful tool, but it's up to us to ensure that it's used for good. CBDCs have the potential to improve financial inclusion, increase efficiency, and create a more equitable financial system. But we need to make sure they're designed with privacy, security, and responsible governance in mind. I couldn't agree more. The decisions we make today will have a lasting impact on the financial landscape of tomorrow. And finally, we encourage you to stay informed, engage in the conversation, and ask questions. The future of finance is something that affects us all, and we all have a role to play in shaping it. Absolutely. The more we understand about these emerging technologies and the choices being made, the better equipped we'll be to navigate this new financial landscape. Thanks for joining us on this deep dive. Yeah, thanks for joining us. We hope you've enjoyed exploring the world of CBDCs and Stellar. And until next time, keep learning, keep exploring, and keep those questions coming.